Professor Giacomo Rizzolatti. Giacomo is a unique Italian because he was born in the former Soviet Union in Kiev, which is very strange how it comes that an Italian born in Kiev is an Italian of a very famous descent. His family for generations consisted of marble traders who traded marble, which Michelangelo and Leonardo and the others used for sculpting, fantastic sculptures in Italy. So they were selling marble to the Tsar of Russia. And that's how his family lived for generations in Russia, then in Kiev. And Giacomo, surprisingly, was born in Kiev. He is the man who is known for one of the most important and famous concepts in present-day neurosciences, the mirror neuron. And I don't want to make accolades now, but I have to tell you, if somebody, Giacomo, would definitely deserve the prize for this discovery. Let me give the word to Giacomo, and please, Giacomo, start your lecture on the mirror neuron, the discovery of one of the most important ideas in present-day neuroscience. Uh, first of all, thank you for this nice and very original presentation. Actually, my family lived for many years in Soviet Union, but my father was a doctor, so the marble tradition finished with my grandfather. My talk will be about uh, mirror neurons. Uh, about 20 years ago, we discovered it in the premotor cortex of the monkey a very surprising set of neurons. Neurons which fire both when the monkey performs a given motor act, like rasping, and when the monkey observes a similar motor act made by another person, monkey or human. Well, in my talk, so what it means? It means that we have a transformation of sensory representation into a motor representation. Then I will, louder, maybe I will use, it's better now. So what it means that there are a set of neurons which make a transformation of sensory representation into a motor representation in the brain of the observer. In my talk, I will present first, briefly, these initial early studies, and then I will talk about more modern stuff. But I think we have to speak about these early studies, because sometimes mirror neurons are not understood in what they are. They are motor neurons in their essence, and in addition, they have other properties. So we started this area, the motor cortex, with uh, Massimo Martelli, who died a few years ago, and others still in the 80s. And what we did was the technique was the classical one, single neuron recordings, but we adapted a ethological approach. So the monkey was playing with us rather than conditioned to monkey and to have a very rigid, very precise, but very rigid situation as most people studying motor system have. So doing this, we recorded single neurons, and yesterday somebody asked me, the Sherman asked me to say, what are uh, action potential? That's what we record with single neurons. Individual neurons speak with this uh, uh, element, action potential, and the code, it's, <coughs> um, it's a frequency modulation. So that's from a book. If you record, for example, from a nerve here, and you are able to isolate single neurons, you have something like that and they are modulated by different type of thing. But the same code is present, the same type of uh, action potential are present in the visual system, in the motor system, and so they can be integrated. So with Mattelli and others, we did first a very careful anatomical analysis of the motor cortex, and we proposed this subdivision, which now is accepted by most authors, and then started the surprises. The first surprise was the following, that we were sure that motor cortex 
encode movements. Not true. Most of the premotor cortex encode what Michael Arby called it motor acts. By motor acts, it means movement related in such a way to reach a goal. So we introduced the concept of goal. And if you see here, the same neuron fires when the monkey grasps with the mouth, grasps with the right hand and the left hand. The classical neurology said that this part controls right hand and so on. But in the premotor cortex, it's different. In primary motor cortex, it's correct, but not in the premotor cortex. Then somebody challenges us and say, well, if you are right, if you grasp it this way or in this way, it should be the same. So we did an experiment using this strange instrument. Here it's a normal pliers. And when you close the normal pliers, it's the same like grasping. Here, instead, you have to open the hand. So exactly the opposite movement. The goal is the same, but the movement is opposite. We place it, a potentiometer between this, uh, uh, this part of the pliers. And here you see the result very in a short way. When it goes down, it means the hand is closing. And when it goes up, it means the hand is opening. And yet, the discharge is concentrated when the goal is reached and not in accordance to the movement. Then the next surprise was that in premotor cortex, many neurons have visual responses. A set of them that we studied in collaboration with Ideo Sakata and Murata, which we have a very long collaboration with Tokyo, with Tokyo especially with uh, Ideo Sakata, so we discovered that some neurons fire, motor neurons, by when you present a visual stimulus. For example, you have a neuron that fire when you grasp in this way. If you present a seed, there is a discharge. If you have a neuron which encode whole hand grasping, if you present an apple, will be a discharge. That was our original discovery, that especially with... Uh, device which has been invented by Sakata, we have a more quantitative thing, and these data were confirmed. And so we know that there is a circuit which includes AIP, an area located in parietal lobe, and area F5, which is located in the promotor cortex, and there is a transformation of affordances of the object into grasping. Well, up to now it was very interesting, but was nothing particularly revolutionary. It was very nice work, I think, that we did. The surprise was the following. That was the big surprise. That were neurons which fired not when you presented something interesting to the monkey, but rather when the monkey and human were doing a, an action which have a similar goal. For example, here the monkey is grasping, and here is the person grasping, and they discharge the same. Now these neurons are known as mirror neurons. Then we show one which many people probably so, but to give you exactly the feeling of what is a mirror neurons. So you have to correlate <laughs> the potential of the strike with the action. This is a typical grasping. And un altro così. Come prima, feeling. Ancora. Here is the mirror effect. The same neuron. Thank you. You see, it's still grasping. It's the goal which is encoded, not the act. Well, I think this film explains everything. It explains first how it's constant, the response, and how there is a kind of dialogue between the agent of the action and the observer of the action. Now, of course, when we discovered it, we were surprised at what could be the function of this neuron. And, uh, we discussed a lot because the first idea was its imitation, which is quite logical. There is all the work of uh, Wolfgang Prince and the other people, which showed that it's very important 
uh, it's not an association with the term in imitation, but rather a kind of uh, connection that you have with, between sensory and motor part. But the other idea was that it's related to understanding of the goal of action. That, because most of the monkey are unable to learn by imitation. That's something which is very up in the hierarchy. So the best explanation is given by this sentence. Uh, Mark Gennaro was excellent writer, besides to be a great scientist. And he wrote, a mere visual perception without involvement of the motor system would only provide a description of the visible aspect of the movement of the agent, but it would not give precise information about the intrinsic components of the observed action, which are critical for understanding what the action is about, what its goal, that's the most important, and how to reproduce it. How to reproduce it is true for human, because there is clear evidence that mirror neurons are very important for imitation. But the goal is what I am going to talk today. And in a sense, it's logical, if you think. Because if you have a visual system, it must be very precise in describing what is the action. If you grasp like that, or grasp like that, or grasp like that. So it should be, the visual system, a very precise description. But the generalization, why it's the goal, cannot be done by the visual system unless you think some very complicated stuff. For motor system, it's very simple because the goal is already there. So if this input from the visual system arrives there, you have what Marc Genero wrote here. So goal understanding. So the other people tell me, well, if you are right, what about the sound of the action? You can recognize the action also from the sound. So we did an experiment, very simple, in which we did an action which could be seen by the monkey, and then we place it an opaque screen, the monkey cannot see it. Only the sound was present. For example, if you break a piece of paper, it's a typical crack. If you break peanuts, you have another type of sound. So here is uh, the experiment in which we broke in a piece of paper into pieces. Uh, this hill here, the histogram, indicate a good response. And here, what happens, one is only sound, the same effect. So it's the modality is not important. The important is the goal of the action. And of course, we did a control with different noises, and there is nothing. This paper we published on science. They asked us for complex uh, statistical analysis, which were absent in this beginning. And if you look at S uh, sound, it indicates that preferred action give a much stronger response than all other action. Well, that was a single neuron. But if we want to have the, all the picture, we must do something else. So we decided to collaborate with Björn and Kern Ellison and to see the whole picture, how these mirror neurons uh, are organized. So the, what they did in Leuven was a very clever thing. To have a monkey which is sitting in sphinx position, fixate a point, and it's uh, still. So it's not a very complex. And, uh, so the same uh, scanner that you use for human study can be used in the evening for monkey studies. So we collaborated with almost 10 years that we collaborate with Gearbang, and I will just summarize very shortly the input to mirror neurons. So you see, we started from STS, the area which has been studied by David Parent. He was the peer pioneer here. That was a rather complex experiment, because at the beginning with fMRI, we saw an activation here and here, so in the parietal, in premotor cortex. And we have single neuron, which shows that that's true. But that is a lot of here. But we didn't know which of these areas really are important in providing information for the mirror neurons. So with uh, Lupino anatomists in our lab, in our department, we injected this part, which are active during action, and observed what part of the STS became active. And here it's indicated, it doesn't matter now the detail, but it's very interesting that also information to the parietal lobe is coming from a real temporal lobe. So there is information about the semantics which reach mirror neurons. And finally, to finish the monkey story, here an experiment which has been done in London. That's an experiment by Roger Lemon, Kraskov, and his group. 
And it's very interesting because it indicates that mirror neurons are present even in the corticospinal tract. So what the mirror neurons actually do, they transform sensory information into motor representation. But this motor representation then somehow intrude in the whole the motor system and create what Michael Arbit would call a motor schema. So we have a motor schema, and when you see an action, this action is reflected in your motor schema, and that's, that's the way you understand it. So it's a phenomenological way. You don't need mentalizing, you don't need complex stuff, but just if I go in the bar and see somebody grasping a glass of beer, of course, visual system describe the hand, describe the mug, but the action per se, it's understood immediately because it's reflected in my motor system and exactly the same program, the same schema. What about humans? We used fMRI in humans immediately. As soon as we discovered it in monkey, we went to Milano. The first experiment has been done in San Rafael. Then I did some experiments with Scott Grafton and Michael Arbit in Los Angeles. But this data that you will see here, it's a meta-analysis made by Carl Zillers and his group, which indicates something that we found with uh, uh, Giorban and the other people before. So in human, there is activation. So the experiment is the following. The student is lying in the scanner, and you present a different type of action. They observe action. You see the activation is here, MT, STS, the parietal lobe, and the premotor cortex. In human, very often, you have also dorsal premotor cortex active, which in monkey, it's, I think, not so frequent. But anyway, that's the point. It's the goal, yes. Another experiment which we did in collaboration also with the Leuven group, it's tool. We present a tool and look, that's it's interesting because here is a normal hand, a human hand grasping. Here is a hand which has given to us from Pisa lab, uh, robotic labs of uh, Dario in Pisa. And so the kinematic is different, the shape is different, but if you look, the activation is very similar. So the general understanding of the goal is common in this case, in this case. If we do the subtraction, we notice something interesting. There is a region in the rostral part of the inferior parietal lobule which is specific for tool. So you see here the two aspects. I will come back to that at the end of my talk. So you, you understand the thing and you have a description how you do it. I think mirror neurons at a certain point have an enormous success. And some people exaggerate a lot in saying that mirror neurons explain everything. So we did an experiment which indicates the limits of this understanding, which I think is fundamental. It's a very simple experiment, which I did with the Buccino. We placed a subject in the scanner, and we presented videos of three uh, persons, of three individuals, of different species, so a human being, monkey, and dog, doing the same action, biting. So it's something which is present in the motor repertoire of the three species. In the second part of the experiment, we presented actions which are typical of one species. So the monkey was doing lip smacking, which is an affiliative gesture. They do it when they know it's my friend or my enemy, I am good, it's a kind of, let's call it affiliative gesture. The dog was barking and the human being was reading, but without sound. Everything was without sound, reading. So you have to recognize the action by uh, lip reading. The results are here. If you look at the left hemisphere, which is here, of course, practically there is no difference. If you do a subtraction, there is nothing. So when we see an action which is present in our motor repertoire, even if performed by a dog or monkey, it's exactly the same circuit which is active. So it may be on the basis of anthropomorphic idea that some people have, my dog is like my son. But if you look at something different, here it's something completely different. In the case of speech of lip reading, you have Broca's activation, you have activation here in the most posterior part, call it verdict if you want. Look at the dog, only the visual part. 
So we don't understand barking because we don't have a motor program for barking. We don't know what means barking. We understand barking as a physical event, not as an event which human being is able to do. This dichotomy, I think it's very important. You will see it even more important when I will talk about emotions because there is part of our behavior which is related to the motor system and to the mirror system and part of our behavior which is mentalizing. So there is no contrast. As a matter of fact, we agree fully with Chris Fried about this dichotomy between something which is understood by mentalizing, by thinking, we, we became a kind of Sherlock Holmes, another in which we understand as phenomenologist because it goes immediately inside ourselves. Then, uh, practically, in many years ago, we moved to emotions, but I will present first some new data on emotion which we got with Fausto Caruana and other people t two, three years ago. So we studied an intermediate part of the emotional system, which is the insula. You see here the insula, which uh, the two hemispheres, the, the brain has been opened, the temporal lobe has been opened, and you see the insula. The experiment was done following uh, what uh, uh, Michael Graziano did uh, in Princeton. So a rather prolonged stimulation, not just a single shock as we, uh, like we do in the motor cortex, but a prolonged. But using this, it was clear that insula, it's a very heterogeneous stuff. So this region here is practically very similar to, to parietal cortex, to somatosensory neurons in the parietal cortex. What is interesting is the motor program which are encoded here. And emotions are only exclusively in the lower part of the insula, which is in agreement to it, uh, the data of uh, Caspers and the other people which make the meta-analysis of, of Silas. But uh, let's concentrate on this part. Here we have indeed motor programs, and then I will demonstrate what happens when we stimulate, by prolonged stimulation, the monkey insula. Here there is no spike, there is stimulation, and every time the slide appears here, in this case, it's doing. Or ingestive behavior, let's say. Every time. So nothing to do with emotion, nothing to do with high function, and ego, and other representation in the ether that somebody proposes. Very simple, ingestive. Now, we move just a few millimeters down, as I told you, this is the ventral part of the insulin which is related to emotions, and you will see what happens here. Red light. Red light. Now we give food. The food she likes. Ah, no good. She looks at it. No. It's only a few millimeters down ventrally, respect to previous stimulation. Now she eats it because we need to reinforce her from time to time. I think it's clear. So when we stimulate this part of the insula, it changes. So we have a positive ingestion and negative ingestion. And in one case, uh, the monkey eats. In the other, she doesn't. So disgust is exactly what it's called. A negative ingestion is disgust. And if you look at Darwin, it's one of the basic emotions because they indicate it's not a stupid thing. This guy, it's very important evolutionary because it indicates that this food is bad. This guy said it's bad, don't go there to eat. Well, at this point, some data which I got about 10 years ago with Christian Kaiser and Vittorio Galese became much more clear. We studied the disgusting humans, and the experiment was done in Marseille. 
because in Marseille they were good in uh, administering odorants to the nose of the students. So the student is in the scanner, and the, in the first part of the experiment, we give odorants to the nose. And uh, it could be pleasant, unpleasant, or disgusted. And here you see the second part of the experiment, in which now there is no natural stimulus given to the student, but the students see a movie in which there is a person which shows disgust or pleasure or it's neutral. We concentrate on disgust at the moment because that's, I have that data in the monkey. And now look what happened with this stimuli. Look at B, which is a section which you see. Insula. There is this red spot activation in the rostral part of the insula. That's not new. Other people before us described it, so it was not new data. What is interesting is here that here the white spot indicates that exactly the same voxels, well, group of voxels, were active when you have uh, natural stimulus and when you observe a stimulus. You see the importance of the finding. So you understand emotion of another not because you do a cognitive process and say, oh, this guy is disgusted, oh, this guy has, is in pain, but you feel it. That's, that's the big difference. I already told you that also for cold action, there is this distinction between phenomenological and Sherlock Holmes-like type of understanding. Here it's even more important because you understand because it enters yourself or because you can understand cognitively. If somebody send me an emoticon with a face which has some happy face, I will know that she, she is happy, but I have nothing here. But if I see somebody with blood, uh, with an accident, I feel inside myself. This is very important. Here is for this gas. Uh, practically in the same period, Tanya Zinger and the group in London described the same thing for pain. And I like especially their uh, singulate data more than insula, because the insula is a bit more complicated than what appears from their experiment. But the experiment was very important because, again, it provides this capacity to put together the two things. Here, I want to show you what Martin Buber wrote many years ago in 23. Ich du, it's a relationship that stresses the mutual holistic existence of two beings. It is a concrete encounter because these beings meet one another in their authentic existence without any qualification or objectification. If you consider another person as an object, you are allowed to do something that we know is happening now in Syria or in other parts of the brain. If you consider the other person is like you, you are not allowed. It's something which we say no in your biological mechanism. This sentence of Buber is very important. Uh, when I talk to other people, not to scientists in general, I also like to mention that the precept which is present in Western but also in Eastern culture don't do something to others that you want not to be done to yourself. It's really basic for our society. It, let's forget the religion part, because that's not important. But they, maybe in those times, if you don't say it, it's coming from God, the people will not believe to you. But anyway, the, the, the notion is fundamental, and it's really based on that. In the last part of my talk, I will speak to you about the future. And uh, the first thing I must say that I mentioned some fMRI experiment, and I think hundreds of fMRI experiment has been done. But there is something fMRI experiment which is really very weak, and that's the absence of time. You have a kind of dead explanation of our activity. You see these blobs. Well, I was really excited. When I, I remember it was, I think, in the 90s when Roland and the group in Denmark uh, presented the data that the people was just thinking of an action, and you saw activity in the press. And I say, my goodness, you can photograph the thinking. But after 10, 15 years, you see the limit of that method. Besides some exaggeration related to some uh, lousy statistics, 
uh, the people at a certain point has to do it because otherwise it will be nothing new. But uh, the point is the time is not present. So we decided uh, to exploit the possibility to record intra cortically essentially in humans using stereo AG. Here is the group uh, and uh, you know of course me and myself uh, Pietro Avanzini was very important in putting together the data and making, uh, I will, you will see in a moment, it's a very complicated experiment to do all the um, software and so on. And also another person which is not mentioned here, Abdullahi, who worked with Giovanni, also was very important. In red are the clinical part. Uh, Ivan is a neurologist and Giorgio Lorusso is the head uh, neurosurgeon. So these people use a method which has been invented essentially by Talarac, by Co, uh, by the French group, to record single neuron and uh, uh, to record uh, um, EG from, uh, stereo EG from the brain of human. Here you see that they put a large set of neurons in each brain, 16 typically, not only, but before they make uh, angiography, to be sure that this electrode will not destroy blood. There is also, of course, uh, the MRI. And here is the electrode. The electrode is done in such a way that you can have many leads. So you don't, each of these electrodes will give you many leads. So you have the possibility to record from 16 by 10, 160 points in one brain. Here you see, for example, what we have now. It is 99 patients and we have 11,000 leads. It's computationally, it's rather complicated to localize all these leads where we have recorded from. But because they have many patients, we overcome, which is the, the worst problem here, to have only few leads and to decide that something is happening there because you have an activity. We have really an enormous amount of leads and you, we can have a picture. And we work exclusively on gamma because uh, uh, the high frequency EEG, which you can record with stereo EEG because we arrived to 150 hertz. So we record really a very high frequency. It's practically equivalent to action potential. We know that uh, gamma is correlated very well with action potential. So the basic experiment, I will show you first, the basic experiment is something we are doing now. The basic was for clinical reasons. They always stimulate some nerves. One is median nerves. And here what you see after median nerve in the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, you see a lot of activity in the primary uh, sensory cortex, both sides. Well, one can say, what, all this effort, well, I can get it very easily with the fMRI. Just put the subject in the fMRI, we, no. Now, what we can see is time. What happens immediately after the stimulation, after 40 milliseconds, after 60 milliseconds, after 100 milliseconds? And here you can see this short movie. That's the situation that you see with the fMRI. You see how progressively it moves out from sensory cortex and it became very important here. It's the perisilvian region, it's S2, it's the operculum, it's the insula. That's insula, that's S2, that's we are back. So it's completely different the picture with fMRI. They don't stimulate only the median nerve, but also other nerve. Here is, for example, the tibial. And you have this classical localization up in the cortex. And here is the trigeminal nerve with this position. By the way, if you look at it, it's interesting. The trigeminal nerve in the right hemisphere has also a spot which is typically of the hand. It's the hand-mouth interaction which is very important in the right hemisphere. And here Avancini was very clever putting color in such a way that if you have similar color, they make the, the logic of the color one. You, you mixture different, so the green, the red, and you see here there is also some interactions. 
now time in a better way. So when we stimulate a medial nerve, we have some leads which fire immediately, and they are located in the primary somatosensory cortex, but there are some which are late, and some which are tonic. So the picture became much more complicated. Here you see, that's classical. It's the fast way, and you see 3A, 3B, and going down for different nerves. So it's somatosensory. It's, but if you look later, I skip this, but late, the tonic stuff is completely different. So you have a lot of activity in the insula, and also you have interaction between all the nerves in the posterior insula. What I described before was here in the gyri long. Uh, this is short. This is the long, this is the short gyri. So you see this application. Now, this experiment, is, I am almost finished. This is an experiment which we have almost finished. So what we do here, the subject, uh, I have forgotten to say that the situation is the following. On Monday, typically, they are operated and these electrodes are inserted. Then we have five, on the Tuesday they are already okay. Then we have three or four days in which we can do what we want. The subject is there and they record day and night both EEG and they make video. So you have a plenty of data and if you have fantasy, you can ask the subject to do different things. There's an experiment on which is a kind of continuation of those we did with Giorban with fMRI. And so it was the presentation of either a hand grasping an object or a tool, a tool was grasping an object. I will show you only the summary of this experiment. Here is the hand action. And we synchronize it with the beginning, with the presentation first slide presentation of it with the action and with the end of the action, when the action is finished. So the black dots indicate when you see just the first life, that's visual area active, when the hand or the tool, here is hand action, when the hand starts to move, there is an activation here, it's in the region of MT, then it goes down, it reaches the premotor cortex, the mirror system, and they, they observe it, they don't do anything here. And then, very interesting, look here. At the end of the action, we have an activation of S2 and of the motor cortex. But remember that that's observation. So when I observe somebody doing an action, I have in my brain a copy of the action as if I was doing the same thing. So I see even the end of it when the, the goal has been reached, or the, this, the touch, I don't want to de now discuss, I don't know wh why it's here, but there are two possibilities, or because it's the goal finished, or because simply you feel the touch of the other people. And uh, look here, that's the area which we describe it for tools, uh, then I move it, look how many <coughs> responses are here. So we, we confirm it in a sense, but in, with another technique that the inferior parietal lobe is fundamental for tool. By the way, one thing, I, I, when I use a new technique, I always like to be sure that it will be confirmed, the old data, the solid data. So here is the data by Casper et al when you observe action. They were so kind to give us the raw data, so we replotted their data, now it's much better. And here are the data from Stereo AG. As you see, it's exactly the same picture, but we have time, and here it's not. Last experiment is something that we, I did with Fausto Caruana. Caruana is more the psychological, like the psychological aspect of our study. And he stimulated, together with Ivana Sartori, the cingulate. You see here the stimulation of the cingulate, but here are motor activity, which I don't care now to. But look, there are some dots, especially here, occasion here, red or yellow. What happens here? The patient starts laughing. Remember that these poor patients are in a ward, waiting for a surgery. 
they are epileptic patients. So there is nothing to laugh, as a matter of fact. The situation is certainly not particularly hilarious. And now you will see what happens with this girl when you stimulate the earth. Oops. Se la muro coltello, maestra, ferro, gatto, arancio, pulsante, auto, un attimo di... Da ridere? Sì. So the neurologist asked to say this word, orange house, I don't know. At a certain point she stopped. She could not stop it from laughing. And when she asked, what happened? It seems so funny. And somebody said, it's so funny, they say, I don't know. I start laughing, I don't know why. That's why we... Uh, by the way, this, this point is specific, because if you go elsewhere, you don't have it. It's not the, the only point which produces laughing. We know that there is crisis, uh, epileptic crisis for hypothalamus, for example, and so on. But to finish with mirror system, then what we did, we presented to the same patients a film in which this young guy was either crying or laughing or was neutral. That was the beginning. Now we have many of these and uh, the paper is in press. So what happens with gamma activity when you see laughing? When you see laughing, it's immediate gamma activity became very high. So the same leads that when you stimulate produce laughing they become active when you see laughing. So that's why I said that what we are now moving from initial idea of mirror neurons in the promoter cortex to idea of mirror brain. So it's the basic principle of organization for many things which is go from disgust to laughing to tool use and so on. I have forgotten to say another thing, that's the last one, about tool. Now we are looking at the precise time, not only the synchronization with the beginning and the end. And you see that uh, when you look at, at the leads, there is first a wave, very short, which goes to pre IP, premotor courses, and give you in, I don't remember, 150 milliseconds, something like that. And then later, at 250, 300 milliseconds, start to be activated the tool area. So in a sense, you first understand what's going on and then your brain is uh, elaborating and decided that it is tool. Well, I'm finishing here. I hope I convinced you that this technique, although it's very complicated because it's four or five years that we started, I think, the beginning. Now the first data are popping out. But it gives you really much more information, fMRI, and allow you somehow to overcome an impasse, which is now with fMRI. Now the people try to s overcome it doing complex, well, multivox analysis, which is in, a, in principle a very elegant and intelligent way. But often, if it's used by the people who are not experts, produce rather bad artifacts. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Giacomo. And we have... Uh, few minutes for questions. So who will start questioning? Oh, Paul. Giacomo, wonderful. What is known about the systems that gate finally the action? Because there's so much going on in the brain which is covered. It's nearly the same pattern as the motor program. So where is the where is the, the, the gate? Yeah. What is known about that? That's a very interesting question. We think that there are several gates. The beginning start probably from cingulate and prefrontal lobe. Now we are sure that one of the gates is pre-SMA. When pre-SMA start to be active, the action, which is only potentially represented in motor cortex, became active. But that's not the only way. Probably the other is going from ventral prefrontal lobe. Uh, from area 46 ventrally and area 12, and it's going to F5A, which is uh, strange. We describe it F5, it's a part of FA, F5, but uh, it's how cytoarchitectonically it's somehow intermediate between real uh, agranular cortex 
a granular cost which frontally. So that's another, but there are only few data of that. One has been done in Leuven saying that uh, stereopsis there. Another is by, well, in Germany, which indicate that uh, they are able to encode uh, a typical way to grasp the things that Scherberger did. It. So, but anyway, I think that, that it's really, the gating is coming from pre prefrontal lobe, but there are two intermediate stations. And we think that uh, press, press MA or F6, as we call it, it's, it's very important. But this otherwise would be impossible to act without this. There was a question from a student, and Judith. Oh. oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for your talk. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm from the material science part, so I may learn some about uh, learn something about the uh, electrode or device. So uh, you uh, implanted the electrode into the human ma human brain at the last part. You implant the electrode into human brain, right? Uh, if uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. that's a very good point in the sense that the people say, so you are, do a, an ethical experiment, you ask the neurosurgeon to implant where you want? No. The neurosurgeon implant where they need to implant. Huh? But the fortune is since they implant, uh, looking for uh, focus in the temporal lobe or in single lobe, or in the motor cortex and so on, we have uh, the possibility to have in different patients, of course, but all the brain explored. So there is nothing that we decide, they decide how to do it. We receive the data, we analyze them. And uh, one of, I hope that we can organize a kind of European or maybe international network to have more data because there are other groups which also do the same procedure but they have very few cases typically. We have many, but if you put all together, we can have, because that, that's the, the criticism, that few, only few leads. Ah, okay, so the, you didn't implant, right? Um, uh, so prof. you want to ask whether they implanted an electrode or not? Yeah, 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 the first question is. No, do, no, no. We, we don't touch the patient. We are not allowed oh, to touch okay. the patient. Okay. The neurosurgeon made all the implants. Because you said that uh, intra in, in the, in the, in the humans, in monkey, we implant, of course. Ah, okay. And Prof, do you have any requirements, special requirements on the re recording electrode? Again, they need the transition. Uh, because I'm from the material science part. So what are the well, the recording electrode that we have now in humans are made by Dixie, which is a French uh, company, and there are several leads uh, from which you can record. The impedance is such that you record EEG. You don't record symbol neurons. But as I said, if you filter and you have gamma activity, you are very close to it. I know there is the possibility to record also from single neurons. Uh, for example, Isaac Fried did it with this particular electrode in which they have this wire. Well, we, we also attempted to do something of this kind, but uh, at the moment, we would like to have the possibility to record the single neurons also from the shaft, not only. But we were not successful at the moment. But I am happy with gamma. At the beginning, I was skeptical, but now I'm very happy with gamma. Okay, thank you, Prof. A thought experiment. Suppose that the arms are paralyzed from birth. Yeah. What would be your prediction about the properties of these mirror neurons? There is an experiment done essentially by Christian Kaiser. I was also helping a bit, but Christian did it. He found a patient with a plastic, so have no hand at all from birth. And then he compared the activity during action observation in this patient and the normal, and you have still activity. Why? Because as I told you, it's the goal which is important. These people learn to do all the stuff, grasping and so on, with their feet, with their mouth, and the area of the hand is occupied by this area. But when they see the action, they have the mirror activity as the other patient. Well, the implication of my question was answered by you, but if there would be no output whatsoever, if there would be no attempt, by the brain to test the 
output of its actions, then there would be no mirror neurons. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I know that now there is a student uh, in, uh, in Cambridge. He wants to do something like that with, uh, with the monkey to prevent action for a long period to see what happens with the mirror. But it's a trick experiment. Yes, yeah. thank you very much for a very interesting talk, as usual. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is a very naive question, but uh, evolutionarily, when do you think that mirror neurons appear? Or if you look across species, where do you find it first? And uh, the second question is about the uh, stereo EG experiment. We are also working you with You also do yeah, that? we do this also. So one thing, uh, have you tried to interfere with the mirror neuron activity uh, with deep stimulation? And what are the consequences of that? No, the second question, we never did that, so I, I have no answer. The first question is really fundamental. Uh, I think it's all social animals have it. When, uh, for example, I'm sure elephant has it, <laughs> because he has this long, uh, Truck, he can do. But uh, to be serious, we know that it's present in humans, it's present in marmoset, it's present in uh, macaque monkey. Now, there is uh, a preliminary note uh, uh, by a group in Trondheim which found that in the parietal lobe of rat, there is mirror neurons which are related to navigation. So I saw only this short. Uh, uh, abstract. I have not spoken with him. Switlock is his name. And uh, he received an ERC exactly for that. Uh, and apparently he is successful. Oh, yes. I, no, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention. Thanks, Wolf. It, it, they are very nice experiments done by uh, a group at Duke, which showed that, that in the bird there is mirror system. Both. It's a very elegant experiment because the bird sing and then the bird listens to the same song. And if you distort the song, it's the neuron does not respond anymore. So it's important for learning to sing and also for distinguishing you are part of the same group of birds or not. So it's, but that's a really extremely elegant experiment. If you think how it's difficult to record single neuron from a bird which is like that. But uh, they were successful. It's, it's very elegant. There are also a group in Germany who did it. Uh, yeah. Question. Okay. Question. Yes, please. You have to translate. Yes. <laughs> you are using the time. Yes. Thank you, Professor. Very nice talk. So I have a question. Maybe I just want to listen to your. Uh, comment about the mirror neurons. What do you think about the mirror, uh, mirror neurons links to our memory? So it's, it's only the reaction of the perception, the direct perception of what we observed, or it has something link, a connection to our memory? Well, memory is a big word which includes so many different aspects. What I can tell you that, uh, in a sense, memory is important because so my idea is, at least, there is a bit of dispute about how mirror neurons are generated. They are genetically determined or they are learned. I think both are true. We are born with a certain number of mirror neurons, but uh, that's uh, relative to what you said. Then when you learn new skill, uh, so that's in a sense it became memory, mirror neurons increase for this skill. And there are several beautiful experiments in this sense. One has been done in London by Calvo Merino, Fritz, and this group with dancers. So if you have a dancer which uh, are expert in classical dance and you present to these people, other people dancing, you have enormous activation of the parietal lobe, premotor cortex, and so on. If you present to the same people dancing a different dance, like capoeira, the Brazilian stuff, nothing like in a normal human. You have some activity, but it's very weak. So when you learn that the specific, and they did also a very clever control. They show it to male dancing of female and male. And you expect, if there was a visual learning, 
that female will be provoked, more activity in the male because they dance together. No, instead it's the male dancing which produces because it's the same action. The second experiment, which is also very elegant, done by Harold Beckering, it's on small children, on toddlers. So if toddlers, uh, that's EEG, they consider the desynchronization of the motor cortex, of the MURI, to so call it. So if the toddlers, it's unable to walk, but able to crawl, you present a film with crawling, and there is desynchronization of the motor cortex. But if the, you present a film in which a small boy is walking, nothing. As soon as this boy learned <laughs> to walk, it became effective. So in this sense, it's not memory, maybe in the proper sense, but when you learn something, it fixes it in your brain, and you understand better. You know, that's again, coming back to what Gennaro wrote, uh, you understand better the thing, if you, the intrinsic, you call it, when you, you know how to do it. If you play tennis, you understand much better what is doing Federer or Nadal than if you never played. Uh, for, for example, cricket, for me, is completely impossible to understand what's going on. But uh, I suppose for many people who never played soccer, the same will be for soccer or for tennis. So when you learn something, your capacity to understand what is going on. And with music, there is a lot of experiment. Heiser in Germany, for example, did with piano players. So with piano players, if you don't see the music but see the hand, you have a much more stronger activation than when you just look at the piano. Thank you. Is there any data on, on a knockdown or knockout of these uh, neurons to see what's happening if you knock them out? Well, or there is. Where is Iriki? Well, it's not knockout, but anyway, it's interesting. Or that they block, block the function or, I mean, le lesion or, or some, something. Uh, I have not understood what yes, you said. Yes, so either lesions or, or, or blocking, I don't know it's, if it's perhaps not possible to identify them both chemically or, or, yeah, just any evidence of what happens if you would no, get rid of them. No, I don't think there is direct evidence, but indirect evidence is a beautiful paper which has been published by Eric Isod and the other recently in Nature in Science of uh, a couple of weeks ago. They recorded from Presme and Singulet in the, this is paper which has been published before, and in this area, there are neurons which fire when you do an action, when you observe an action, and mirror neurons. In this animal, which have a genetic defect, and uh, they exactly examine it with kind of gene where deleted, you have the disappearance of the neurons which encode the other and the mirror neurons, while the neurons, act, when you are acting, are still present. So that's a, a demonstration that you have a kind of genetical determination of mirror neurons and mirror of others in this area. It's not exactly what you want, but I don't have <laughs> anything to tell you. Further questions? Please. Oh, yeah, please. Well, thank you very much for your generosity in, in explaining your line of discovery. But my simple question is that, in the context of contextual intelligence, how does the interplay of the IQ and EQ naturally, you know, disembark the kind of journey that you think uh, by DNA analysis is very normal and, 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 and neutral in terms of development? It's not something erratic, it's something like, you know, that you say that you know it could be subjective. So something that is normal instead of subjective, and at times as you see your, your, your references on expression, that is a question of emotional dimension. So how does your uh, alignment and discovery in the context of the IQ, EQ, that interplay with the uh, you know, contextual intelligence. Maybe you have to specify oh, which experiment you are mentioning exactly. I mean, I mean, overall, in your in your in your discovery journey, what what you find 
unique that you align yourself with your feeling that uh, has got to do with Darwinian kind of thought. But Darwinian kind of thought is always, uh, you know, the strongest, the adaptability that allows, you know, uh, survival. And survival seems to be the mechanism that moves the human or the genetic capability in the DNA naturally conceived in a particular uh, being. So it's not really in the sense that it is naturally, it goes across the board. So in other words, it's rather specific to one particular, you know, uh, now, you know th yeah. Now listen, if I understand correctly, now you uh, somehow are against the idea of Darwin and Ekman that emotions are some which are common to all human beings, but also to many species of animals. So you think it's culturally determinate. My idea is the opposite. I think that the basic uh, emotion, the seven basic emotions, are present in all animals, at least in mammals, maybe even before, but certainly in mammals and in all species. Uh, I would say that, that the music is the same, but the director can interpret it differently. So if uh, Japanese, for example, are much more restrained in showing their emotion, and let's say Italian Southerners are very doing like that, that's not indicate the emotion are different, but the expression of emotion changes. So I think Darwin was absolutely right, and are wrong those which interpret these cultural differences as something biologically. It's something which just modifies the way in which the director of orchestra interpret a piece of Beethoven or a piece of Mozart. Final question? There is a final question over there. Sorry. Um, so the mirror, the mirror neuron system has been implicated in a variety of neuropsychiatric disorders like autism spectrum disorders in which the lack of empathy and lack of social cognition has been attributed to impaired um, mirror neuron system. So given this, will you be able to um, give an insight on how further experiments done in the macaque monkeys will be able to guide um, the future of medicine in looking at impaired mirror neuron system? You know, we make a very timid attempt to interpret autism, and it has been misinterpreted because our idea was in autism there is a profound deficit in the motor system, and now the work of Mostovsky and the other people indicates true. And we said, since the motor system is developing poorly, also the mirror system will be poorly developed. And I think we are absolutely right on this point. About the other disease, like narcissism, for example, many people ask me, how you, why you don't study narcissism? Because that will be a typical case in which instead of going outside, you go inside yourself. Narcissism is those patients which think they are great, and the people doesn't like them, but they, are, uh, they have a great personality, they deserve a lot of things, and the people are so stupid to understand they are so. So in this case, their capacity to interact with the other somehow is destroyed, and all the, uh, using uh, Freud idea, fluid is going towards yourself rather than towards the other. But I, I am afraid that I am a bit scared to do a study on uh, psychiatry with this elementary stuff. Because uh, there are so many different elements in that. I explained now narcissism as something very simple, but probably there are many, many other factors. And schizophrenia, that, for example, my friend Galese tried to do something, but not very successful. <laughs> schizophrenia is really so complicated. It's not only that you are not related to the other in the normal way, but you have a kind of devil inside yourself we generate a lot of things, hallucination and other things. So at the moment, I am a bit scared of uh, psychiatry.
psychiatry, although that's the frontier here. Oh. Wonder whether you have done on people with autism with the same experiment, and I want to see your view on that. Yes, with autism, we did, I think, I, I like this experiment I did with a neurologist, Catania. So the experiment we did was the following. The, the boy was sitting there and doing an action, which could be rather take a piece of chocolate and eating, or take a piece of chocolate and uh, putting in a, in a box, let's say. So normal people, one have to do this action, already in the first part, of the, the action, have the preparation to eat. So it's uh, the intention, it's reflected in the preparation. If they have to put here, there's no activation of uh, myeloidea or muscle which open the mouth. So that was the first difference between normal, typically developing children and autistic children. So the capacity to prepare to uh, their intention, it's reflected in the action. The other aspect was that when the normal, the typically developed children, observed another kid doing this action, the, the action of the other intruded in the motor system, and you have activation of myeloideos when they started the action. In the children with autism, it was nothing. There's no activity for them that was neutral. So that's why I think that it's not the pure grasping activity or something that but this chain which are present with mirror neurons which are lesioned in, in autism. And then, there are, you know, sometimes I think if it's correct to speak about autism, because sometimes what dominate are uh, this uh, social aspect, sometimes it's affective. Uh, then there is a large difference between high functioning and low functioning. You cannot put in the same pot people which are very intelligent and people which have so low IQ that you can do anything with them. And then to say autism. And then there is 30% which have epileptic seizures, which uh, determine other uh, symptoms. So autism is really a term which was used especially by psychologists in a very large sense. Of course, DSM-5 specifies some uh, particular aspect of it. But if you look at real clinical stuff and you see a children which is hard, uh, really defective, which have very low IQ, it's completely different from a kid which have 120. One guy, it's really very, it's not adapted to society, but he's very good with computer, do a very intelligent play. The other, it's like, a, like what you can expect if you don't have intelligence. Thank you so much. I'm afraid in the interest of time, we have to stop questioning now. If somebody has questions, to Professor Izzolotti. He is here for a few more days. So let me thank you, Giacomo, for this fantastic speech. Thank you. You have set the level for the rest of the conference.